Well, good morning. My name is Matt Hadley. I'm the senior pastor here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, and I welcome you to this Memorial Day uh, worship experience. This is a special day. It is a Trinity Sunday in which we remember God three in one. But also within our denomination, it's an important day as it is Peace with Justice Sunday. And we're going to be hearing more about that uh, a little bit later. Because it is Memorial Day weekend, those of you who are watching from home may be watching on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or later in the week. But it doesn't matter when you worship with us. We're so happy that you are tuning in and worshiping with us. And for those of you who are here in-house, isn't it great to have the seat cushions back in the pews? Isn't that much better than sitting on the hard wood. It's harder to fall asleep if you uh, are sitting on hard wood. So I'm going to be paying extra attention to all of you today to make sure that you're awake all the way with me. We do value prayer here uh, very, very much. And so we want your prayer request to be heard. And I want you to disregard the number that is up there on the screen. For those of you, in, there, there's the right number. Uh, the number is 414-331-2691. And when it comes time to the prayers of the people, we are going to uh, hear our items of joy and concern, and our prayer team is going to be in prayer with them. And so on this absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous Sunday, I invite you in-house to stand as we worship our God on this Trinity Sunday, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, uh, God in three persons, Blessed Trinity.
we have a call to worship for us this morning, and if you would allow me to lead it, I invite you to be the people of God in your response. And so let's look at our screen. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe, Ascribe to, to the, the Lord, Lord the glory of his name. name. Worship, Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Amen. And so before we take our seats, let's turn and wave to one another. This is our passing of the peace. Hello, brothers and sisters. And then I invite you as you are uh, ready to have a seat, and we're going to receive our children's message via video. And it's going to be a good one because it's going to help us to better understand what this whole Trinity thing really is. Good morning, friends. Welcome to Trinity Sunday. This Sunday is the one where we celebrate that we serve one God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So there's one God, but we understand God in three persons. Some people have compared this to an egg, where an egg has an outer shell, the inside white, and the yellow yolk. Other look at an apple. An apple has a peel, but also inside fruit that we eat and then further in, there's a seed. Each of those serve a different purpose. One protects the fruit, one is meant to give us nourishment, and one is meant to help us grow more fruit. Maybe you've seen a shamrock. The shamrock is supposed to be a symbol of the Trinity as well. Each leaf representing God, the Father and Creator, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Some people have described the Trinity as phases of water. You know water, but sometimes when you see steam coming out of a pot, did you know that's also water? That's water in the form of a gas. And the water we drink or swim in is a liquid. And most of us are familiar with ice, especially living in Wisconsin, right? Ice is water in the form of a solid. Even though they all have different properties or uses, they each still are water at all times. We experience God's grace throughout our lives. Through grace, God made us. And through grace, God saved and redeemed us with Jesus. And through grace, we are becoming more and more like God through the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 3, 13 through 17, we experience God all together at once. After Jesus is baptized, he comes out of the water and a spirit of God comes down like a dove. At the same time, the voice of God the Father says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. So which is it? How do we understand God? Are there three parts? Are there three different phases of God? And how does this Trinity all work? Well, we serve one God. God is expressed differently at different times, but they're all still God. It's a mystery. We don't completely understand everything there is to know about God. But here's what we do know. God is love. God loves us, and God wants us to love others in God's name. As we think about all the different ways that we understand God, it's important that we follow by loving one another. Let's pray together. Holy Trinity, dancing mystery, you are the light from light, and we worship you as one God, lover beloved, and love. Open our eyes to see that we are your children. Open our hearts to the life of Jesus, your son. Open our mouths 
to breathe the of your spirit. Amen. Amen. So that cleared it all up, right? Now we know exactly what the Trinity is. And so Pastor Andrew is here, and he's going to head out with the children that are here and uh, get even a further understanding of uh, the mystery that is this God that, that we love and the God that loves us. Well, before we continue on with worship, there is uh, our June newsletter has been put out, but not everyone reads the electronic uh, version of it. There's a letter that has been put in the mail that you should be receiving on Tuesday, but I know that there are many of you at home that uh, don't receive any of that correspondence, but you're, you're new with us. And so I want to share with you something that is coming out with my name on it, although it was really a, a joint effort with uh, the staff we have here at Whitefish Bay and other denominational leaders. Here's what this letter says. Dear church family, on May 13th, the CDC updated recommendations that fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks or physically distance in either indoor or outdoor settings. It did not take long for Glendale, Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, and other surrounding communities to lift their mask mandates. So what does that mean for us here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay? We have followed CDC guidelines up to this point, and that's what we'll be doing now as well. Beginning June 6th, Masks are optional in worship for those who have been vaccinated. The CDC has indicated that the chances of a fully vaccinated person contracting COVID are very low. And even if they do, the chances of having a life-threatening case are negligible. They continue to recommend that unvaccinated people wear masks. And we know that here in the North Shore, we're over 90% vaccinated of those who are of an eligible age. We are strongly suggesting this too. But at this point, you must make that decision. The mask decision is yours. We know that some of you are not yet comfortable in public without masks, and some have not yet been vaccinated. So while masks are optional, we encourage you to wear your mask. Our pastors, staff, and hospitality volunteers will continue to wear masks when interacting with worshipers. But what does this mean for our families with school-age children? Registration is no longer required for children to be a part of our Sunday morning programs, and we will only offer Sunday school for elementary children at 1030 through Labor Day. Our volunteers and nursery staff are all vaccinated and will continue to wear masks. We also require children over two to be in masks because they're not yet eligible for any kind of vaccination. Like before, preschool and nursery children will go directly to their rooms upstairs Elementary kids will leave from the 1030 service with Pastor Andrew through the back of the sanctuary uh, and narthex to have their lesson outside at 816 East Glen or distanced in Fellowship Hall if weather is not cooperative. Wellness and cleaning are still a priority. Please contact Pastor Andrew if you have any questions. Throughout the summer, we will continue our flow of traffic, entering through the silver spring doors in front of the church and exiting out the side door, leaving the sanctuary. Holy Communion will continue to be in the pews with the communion kits and then offered outside for 30 minutes after the conclusion of the 1030 service. These last 15 months have been hard on everyone who desires to be in true community and fellowship in person. This new CDC recommendation comes as great good news. Having said that, I am aware that some in our church family are still going to be very cautious, and rightfully so if their household contains someone who may be at a higher level of risk. It is going to be our continued commitment to offer the highest quality live stream and Facebook live broadcasts weekly at 9 o'clock and 10.30. It is my prayer that by September, all restrictions will be lifted, but that doesn't mean that life returns back to normal. I pray we take new opportunity, a new opportunity to renew our commitment to membership and to never again take for granted the beauty of gathering and service. With this optimism comes caution. We will keep this in our prayers while understanding that if new variants start surfacing, we will need to act accordingly. It is our promise to you that we will continue to monitor the situation. I look forward to sharing with you plans we have to revitalize our ministries and reach our community with good news. 
news that is even better than the end of the pandemic in Christ, Pastor Matt. And so I do take this as good news, and I hope as the summer carries on and as we roll into the fall with even more children and more families uh, gathering safe in the sanctuary that we can really worship our God in person together as often as possible. And so let's receive this musical offering. Let us come before the Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit in a time of prayer. The Lord be with you and also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them come up, up to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to, to give, give our, our thanks, thanks and praise. And so on this Trinity Sunday, we turn to God in a time of silent and listening prayer. We do love you, O oh God, and we offer thanks this day for all that you have made and all that you have given to us. For the abundance of your love, forgiveness, and grace, we give you thanks and humbly lay our lives before you. Jesus, our Savior, we marvel at the sacrifices you made for our sake, for coming to be God with us, for teaching about kingdom living, and for assuring us that in times of joy or sorrow, we would never be alone. 
for the ways you model right, just living and teach us how to love one another, we give you thanks and humbly lay our lives before you. your breath of life in the world at creation, your presence with all our ancestors in faith, and your dramatic Pentecost appearance to early Christ followers, for continuing to empower and strengthen us each day as we face the challenges of life. We give you thanks and humbly lay our lives before you. Today, O oh God, we ask you to comfort all who are hurting, to console those who are grieving, to heal those battling physical or mental illness, and to forgive all who have sinned, every one of us. Especially this day, O oh Lord, we pray to be used as channels of your peace, to break down all injustice that dehumanizes other human beings, whatever their nationality, race, religion, or sexual orientation. Give us vision to see all your children as you see them and open our hearts to offer them our love without reservation. Now, O oh God, hear these particular prayer requests from our congregation today. This morning we give the Lord thanks and praise for Patty Vanden Plas's 34th wedding anniversary and for Pastor Janet's birthday. We lift up prayers of strength for a sister and brother-in-law, continued healing for Lynn Bennett and Natalie Hatch. And a wife gives thanks to her husband, Joe, as they celebrate today their 34 years together. We lift up prayers for a sister who's suffering with leukemia. And we pray for Pat and hope that the abscess on her neck can be removed. We also lift up a young man named Tyler who came out to his parents as being gay only to find that they have rejected him and asked him to leave the family. Please, Lord, be with Tyler and give him the strength he needs to continue to live an honest and authentic life as your beloved child. We lift up all the many people across the world who are continuing to navigate the pandemic. And finally, we pray that this summer can be a time for reunions and rejoicing and celebrating. And that at each of those opportunities, when we have an opportunity to share life with friends, we take a minute to thank you, Lord. These are the prayers of our people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Keep us faithful to the gospel and open to the mystery of the Trinity in our lives on this day and every day. And we also ask on this Memorial Day weekend, when we remember those who have died for freedom's cause, that your Holy Spirit would ignite our hearts with passion to work for justice and peace for all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Pastor Matt mentioned earlier, this is across the denomination, all across the globe in the United Methodist Church, Peace with Justice Sunday. And we have a short video to explain to you what this initiative is all about. Did you know when you donate to the Peace with Justice Sunday offering, you support development of local social justice ministries in each conference? an organization of networks to engage in social advocacy and action. Our social principles call us to love our enemies, seek justice, and serve as reconcilers of conflict. We insist that the first moral duty of all nations is to work together to resolve by peaceful means every dispute that arises between or among them. Donations collected on this special Sunday allow witness to God's demand for a faithful, just, disarmed, and secure world. The United Methodist Church, with its historic commitment to peace and justice, provides leadership to this social transformation. Each annual conference has a Peace with Justice coordinator developing local social justice ministries. 50% of the offering remains in your annual conference to support this ministry Help us create efforts of peace and justice across the connection. Your gift helps strengthen our capacity to advocate for peaceful solutions. Give in person, by mail, or online at umc.org ssgive. That is indeed one of the ways that you can give on Peace with Justice Sunday to that initiative. However, if you do that, it's not going to show up on your own local church offering statement. So we suggest that you make the offering through this congregation, either today using one of the special envelopes that you in the sanctuary may have received when you came in or that we have by the offering box uh, here down front. Or you may uh, give online and indicate the special gift. You may give by sending in your check. All the usual ways that you make your offerings, you can choose to uh, make an offering for Peace with Justice Sunday. As the video stated, 50% of the offerings made in Wisconsin stay in Wisconsin. And our Peace with Justice coordinator in the conference is someone you know. Appropriately, it's Pastor Peace is the Peace with Justice coordinator. So help to support the work here with your gifts uh, as well as supporting it globally. We of course make our regular tithes and offerings each week and we generally have a Mission Sunday uh, offering or a Mission Month and we will start that in, in the first Sunday of June and that will be in June, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, let us pray to God to bless all of our gifts Oh God, all that we have from you is yours to be used through us. We pray that the gifts that we make through this congregation will help us all to lay our lives before you in service and in ways that lead to peace and justice. We ask your blessing on all of our offerings this day. Amen. Yes, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Before I get into my sermon, just a moment of personal privilege. I want to thank those of you who were aware and extended uh, best wishes and warm thoughts at the passing of my stepfather who passed away on uh, Friday morning, uh, very early in the morning. Um, I, when my biological father died, I was a teenager and uh, I became an adult, really, uh, under this stepfather of my, mom, of my mom. My mom was married to, for 
to my father for more than 30 years and to my stepfather for more than 30 years. And I was sharing this with a friend, and, and he said, kind of tongue-in-cheek, does she got 30 more years in her? And when I shared that with my mom, she, that got her to laugh and giggle. So I think there was some healing in the thought of that. But uh, thoughts and prayers to uh, my mother and, uh, and family. Well, we heard in our call to worship today from Psalm 29 about this God who sits on a throne like a king, not a dictator, but a king of love, enthroned right there, a divine king who has uh, control and reign over the waters, over the, the chaotic waters of life. And each and every one of us have opportunities with chaos of, of life. Indeed, anytime we contemplate dying death or bereavement, we, we turn to God and we have this good God, this divine king who brings peace to God's people. We heard in the very last stanza from Psalm 29, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And we know that people who have been blessed with peace are peacemakers themselves, peace extenders, which leads to justice, peace with justice. But in the Old Testament, we have another powerful account of our God in a throne room, sitting highly exalted. This is the call of Isaiah, the way Isaiah tells it. In the year that King Uzziah died, an earthly king, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Here am I. Send me. Powerful words, a powerful call. Isaiah, at a point in his life, acknowledging that he was flawed just like we're all flawed, a powerful moment in his life where he made a decision on how he was going to live his life. And friends, only you can really make that decision, how you're going to live your life. Isaiah decided it's going to be lived in obedience to the Lord of hosts, this God that today we celebrate as three in one. And so this three in one God said, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, me, me, send me. Isaiah is committing to a life that knows no selfishness. He's going to live a life that doesn't strive after his own interests, but instead he's going to live for a higher calling. And we know it wasn't going to be easy. The life of a prophet or a missionary or a minister or a committed disciple of Jesus Christ is not always easy. And when, t when trouble comes, there is a temptation. When things get too hot and too heavy, there is this temptation to run to comfort, to find an easier path. There is something about our human condition, isn't there, friends, that makes us want to, to, to just bend into our creature comforts? Paul knew this. St. Paul knew this. The temptations that come while trying to live a faithful life. 
And in the text that I'm about to read for us uh, right now, he, he really addresses this. And so we're going to take a slow walk through this. I'm going to break down this very short passage into five even shorter segments. And after each segment, we're going to hear a modern translation of this, maybe to help us understand it in a, a little bit better way by Eugene Peterson and his translation, The Message. And so let's go to what Paul has to say in the eighth chapter to the church in Rome. He says, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit you put, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so here's how Peterson translates that. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and to get on with your new life, a new life that is through the Spirit. And with it comes life and peace. Without it, death is inevitable. And so, friends, we too, like Isaiah, choose how we're going to live, either by it or against it. Allowing ourselves to be led by the Spirit. Now, we talk about the Spirit as the, the, the breath, the winds of God, but we're not one just to be blown around by the wind. Who knows where we're going to end up? No, the Spirit is guiding us, and we give ourselves to that. And when we do that, it's going to shape who we are, and it's going to shape what we do. When we turn away to the temptations of the flesh, when we turn away from the easier way, when we turn away from sin's appeal in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome any temptation that may come our way. And so Paul continues in these words to the church in Rome. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. All who are led by the Spirit of God. Peterson says, God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. But we say, what does it mean to be led by the spirit? To truly be led by the spirit means to have our, our changed our future from life to death, to, to have changed our relationship from God from rebellion to obedience. I think I did the life and death thing backwards there, but you're smart, intelligent people. You know exactly what I was saying, even in the comfort of your padded uh, pews i got to get right back to it. We are no longer an enemy to the way of God. No, as children of God, we are now ambassadors of it. We are called to run with that torch, to work for peace, to work for justice, to be the hands and feet of our God led by the Spirit. But Paul continues. It says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, But you have received a spirit of adoption. Did you know that you've all been adopted? We are all of us adopted. Peterson says this resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It is adventurously expectant. Our adoption into the family of God, our adoption into the household of God leads us to live lives that are adventurously expectant. I did some research this week on adoption in the Roman culture. And in the Roman culture, the adopted person loses all the rights of the own family, old family, and gains all of the rights of a legitimate child of this new family. They become an absolute full heir to the father's estate. Under Roman law, back in the biblical days, an adopted child was guaranteed legal rights to all of the father's property even if they were formerly a slave. The same rights as the other biological children, never a second-class son or daughter, but equal to all the other children in the father's family and could not be disinherited. But we hear Paul tell this Christian group in Rome that we too are all adopted. And so likewise, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she gains all of the privileges and all of the responsibilities of a child In God's family. We have been liberated from the bondage of fear and the and the 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 stipulations of the law. What we know is we are not an orphan, a black sheep, or from a broken family lineage. You have a new family, and all of us have a new older brother, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. 
What a great and wonderful promise it is that we are allowed to be God's children. John even wrote about this in 1 John, that first little letter. He says, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. But here's the thing about that, especially when it comes to working for peace and working for justice in the name of this triune God, when we can really get to the point that we see the others, or when we see the other as God's children too, we communicate with them differently. We advocate for them as family. They're no longer just one of those people. They're no longer someone who is, is a, a problematic contemporary, but they too are a blessed, a cherished child of God. They may behave poorly, but we behave poorly as well. They may be needy, but we are needy as well. They're no longer at arm's length. They draw near to us because we are all together children of God. And so how do children address their parents? Paul continues on with this new relationship. He says, when we cry, Abba, Father, which is really like saying, Daddy, a term of of real endearment. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Peterson translates it, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are, father and children. And we know where we are going and what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. Fully adopted in our inheritance is life everlasting, life everlasting. But it also can bring us great comfort knowing this as children of God. On my very first Christmas Eve service here five years ago, and I, I'm positive you all remember every single word I said at, a, at an 11 o'clock Christmas Eve sermon uh, five years ago uh, in December. But I told a story about a young father who was suddenly thrust into the reality of being a single dad. His wife, the mother of this young boy passed away very suddenly, very unexpected. And you can imagine that was a heavy household, a little boy no longer having his mother. And it was a common occurrence for this little boy in the middle of the night to kind of cry out. Maybe some of you have had children with with night terrors. And he would cry out from down the hall, Daddy! Daddy! And the father said, come in and lay down with me. And the the boy started to calm down. And he said, are you okay? And the little boy replied, as long as I know you're looking at me, as long as I know you're watching me, I think I can sleep in peace. The father stroked his son's head until the eyes were closed and the unmistakable heavy breathing of deep sleep set in. And then that father got up and looked out into a a starry night, just a clear, starry night, and basically said, Abba, Father. Basically said, Daddy, if you're looking at me, I'm going to be okay. I know I can have peace. That's the kind of relationship we have with Abba, Father. And whether we cry out, Abba, Father, in times of fear or joy or confession, or thanksgiving, praise, or simply a desire to be close. In doing that, we are opening our lives to God and taking our place in the life of God. We are acknowledging what already is, that God is present, that God will respond, and that as long as we are truly seeking those things that are within the will of God for our lives, God's first answer is always going to be yes. That doesn't mean we always get what we want, but perhaps the Rolling Stones had it right. You can't always get what you want, but you, you get what you need. And friends, we have no greater need than to be within the household of God. God's yes means that God will always open God's life to us and that God will answer our deepest, our deepest and most profound needs and requests. It is in God whom we live, whom we move and have our being. And that's what it means to be born from above. 
To cry out, Abba, Father, is to claim and to seek our birth from above. Our birth from above. It means that we take our place in the life of the Holy Trinity. And the Holy Trinity is mystery. Even though Pastor Andrew did a great job with those object lessons in the video, it is still a mystery. It's a mystery that leads to a shared life. It's a mystery, this triune God who calls us to be forever opening ourselves to receive the life of another, pouring ourselves out into the life of another. That cry, Abba, Father, does not simply describe who God is, but also how God is. But that doesn't mean everything's going to be rosy. And Paul reminds them of that with this very last sentence from our text. If, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And so the last translation from Peterson says, if we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. And so yes, we may suffer. Whatever the believer may suffer, it pales in comparison to what the the church family is going to ultimately gain. And so like the prophet Isaiah, who knew the road was not going to be easy and yet still said, here I am, Lord, send me, so too should we as members of the household of God. Everybody needs a place to belong. Everybody needs a sense of family. And this God, three in one, creator, redeemer, sustainer, establishes a home for us. And so to be at home in God's family with God's children, our brothers and sisters, no matter what they look like or no matter where in the world they are from, to be a member means to share a common life, a shared in mutual interdependence. And God, through this Holy Spirit, treats us just like family, unites us as family. We all belong to God's family. It's no mistake that throughout the history of Christian communities, we've been calling ourselves a church family. And to be church family means that we bring the same expectations to the church family as we do our families of origin, the expectation of love and patience, the expectation that we should uh, treat one another as our own family, to steer clear from those attributes that destroy families. And I know enough about life that maybe some of you have had families that are seemingly destroyed. We heard in the prayers of the people, a family that's never gonna be the same because a child said, you know what, I'm not like my brothers. I'm not like them, I haven't been created the same way and and so there is something that destroys it. But there are attributes that destroy regular families, families of origin, adopted families and church families. The uncaring disregard for the under destroys family. Selfishly ignoring the needs of others, not working for peace with justice destroys family. Preoccupation with ourself at the expense of just decent consideration destroys families. Everyone has a need to belong, and this God, three in one, establishes a home for us. On Trinity Sunday, we say this is true. Now, I know Memorial Day weekend is filled with picnics, and what a beautiful, God has blessed us with a beautiful day to be outside and out and about, but I know that, you know, we probably all end the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend by reading through the entire Bible at night before we go to bed, right? And when you do that, nowhere in the Bible are you going to see the word Trinity. Now, that word just wasn't on the radar yet. And yet, time and time again, we see all these different attributes of God that let us know that there's, there's, there's just, we need more ways to explain, to describe the depth and the mystery of this God of salvation. And so it really wasn't until the year 213 that a man named Tertullian actually first used that phrase. And it wasn't until the year 325 at a council in Nicaea that the official doctrine, the official theology was finally put in place. And you can imagine what kind of a meeting that was, how long that took to to get it all ironed out that there would be one thought of this trinity. And so if you were a member of our sister church, just Kitty Corner, the Christ Episcopalian Church right there behind Sendix, every Sunday when they gather together, 
the people of the church recite the Nicene Creed. We're more apt to recite the Apostles' Creed here. But on this Trinity Sunday, I want us to read together as family, brothers and sisters, each and every one of us, the Nicene Creed. And so why don't we say together in one voice the Nicene Creed as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was the incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so, yes, we've had these texts set aside by the church fathers to be our text on this Trinity Sunday. And especially this passage from Romans, we see the inner working of the three members of, of the Trinity equally interdependent, interdependent with each other. And so, friends, this Trinity empowers us to do the work of peace with justice. And so I want to end this sermon with a prayer. Let us pray. Everlasting God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, and ever live and reign in perfect unity of love. Grant that we, your adopted children, may always hold firmly and joyfully to this faith and living in praise of your divine majesty, may finally be one in you, you who are three persons in one God, forever and ever. Amen. And so I invite the community of faith to stand as you are willing and able as we have our final musical offering, Creation of Peace by Mark Miller.
just love that uh, piece of music. Uh, several years ago at annual conference, as we were all gathered together, Mark Miller was there and led us in that music. Friends, we have some next steps. There are all kinds of groups that you can be a part of here. Uh, all the information is found on our, on our website, uh, ways that we can connect with one another. Uh, if you want more information about uh, the Peace with Justice Sunday, um, there's these information cards here and there are envelopes. I know maybe some of you would like to support this and uh, did not come with an opportunity to make an offering. So you can take this envelope home and, and just bring it to us whenever you may like. But we think about peace with justice, and we think about the understanding that all of us are adopted children of our God. And so my challenge for you this week is to acknowledge everyone that you see as a brother or a sister, an aunt or an uncle, a mother or a father, a grandma or a grandpa, and how might you treat them differently? If your first response isn't, they're different, but your first response is, that's my family member. May God bless you all this week as you live out your faith. Amen.